I'd just like to echo uh, Chantelle in welcoming you all back. Um, I think the, the rain may have discouraged some of the native Tucsonans who aren't used to the idea that you, know, you can actually emerge when water is falling from the sky. Um, but I think probably our crowd will pick up a little as the day goes on. You may have also noticed, if you were watching the streets at all, that Tucsonans drive incredibly slowly when it rains. They, they get a little nervous about it. Um, just a word about how we'll proceed with the panel. We're going to let our three um, panelists give their presentations just back to back and not pause in between for questions so we can keep some momentum going then. We'll um, have the panelists up here at the front responding to each other's papers, sort of talking about any uh, common points of interest or themes we see emerging, things that they think would be profitable to discuss that they'd like to offer, uh, like to ask each other. And then we'll open it up to uh, questions and comments from the audience as well after that. Um, so without further ado, we are delighted to have Rohini Srihari, who is an associate professor of computer science and engineering um, from the University at Buffalo, SUNY. And her talk will be on multilingual text mining lost in translation, found in native language mining. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Suhari. Okay, um, first of all, uh, uh, I'd really like to thank the organizers for putting together this really fascinating uh, conference and symposium. For me, it's been nothing but a learning experience since yesterday, um, learning different aspects of multilingualism. So I really uh, welcome the opportunity to participate. So uh, yesterday, we heard some talks, uh, which were very interesting and I think made a compelling case um, for you know, the problems and, and the pitfalls with uh, monism, as um, Chantel just mentioned. And, um, you know, so I think those points really hit home uh, pretty hard yesterday based on, on the talks we heard. And I think they were focusing uh, primarily from the perspective of policy and uh, regulations and government and, you know, what, what is being enforced and what should be encouraged. Um, to, I, what I'd like to do today is give you a little bit of a different perspective in terms of multilingual usage as we see it on the web. And the web, uh, as you know, is a wild and woolly place. There are no rules and regulations. People do whatever they want. They say whatever they want. So um, the advantage of that is we really see the kinds of phenomena that are emerging in terms of multilingual usage. So I just want to talk about that a little bit. Um, now, what is multilingual? So I changed the title a little bit. Instead of lost in translation, I made it lost in machine translation. As a computational linguist, whenever we think about translation, we're always thinking about machine translation. So I should have uh, made that a little bit clear. So I, I do a lot of work in uh, multilingual text mining. And so some of the questions might be, what does that mean? You know, What are you trying to mine? What kinds of things are you trying to uh, information are you trying to glean from the web? So I, I want to talk a little bit about that and then get into some of the problems with, uh, uh, you know, machine translation as we see it and how the web can actually help with a lot of that. So, um, so a little bit, first of all, some statistics in terms of language usage on the internet. Um, I, I know there's been a lot of emphasis on uh, Spanish uh, yesterday and, and today, and that's because I think of where we are and, and the you know, prevalent use of Spanish. But if you look at, um, in terms of language usage on the web, um, English is, is still the number one language, and Chinese a very close second, and you'll see how close in, in a minute, 
And Spanish uh, is the third. And so these are statistics uh, compiled uh, by an organization that's constantly monitoring the volume of traffic on the web. And in a minute, I'll show you some, some more interesting trends in terms of multilingual usage on the web. And the rest are 42.4. So I think uh, from my perspective, that's what's most interesting in terms of the rest, you know, what's going on there and, and how do we get to uh, that kind of information. Um, but it should be noted, you know, uh, people talk about social media and Twitter, and I'm always getting asked questions about the Twitter firehose and how much information there is. Um, but it's interesting to note that um, there's a Chinese microblogging site called Weibo, and the volume of traffic on Weibo has uh, exceeded all of Twitter's volume on several occasions. So, I mean, this is, this is a real phenomenon happening in terms of um, non-English uh, usage on the web. And just to um, uh, hit this home, I don't know how much of this you can see in detail, um, but you know these are again this is uh, these are statistics put together by Internet World Stats, and you can go to the site and look at it. Um, so it shows some interesting trends here. It shows you know in the column one to third column the Internet penetration by language, and those are sort of the percentages that I showed you on the previous chart. But to me, what's most interesting here is um, the fourth column, which shows the growth in, in the internet usage. And if you look at it, um, the language that has grown in terms of usage from 2000 to 2011 by 2,501% is Arabic, okay? And then you have Chinese also, 1,500%, and Russian, you know, 1,800% growth in those languages. So while English, you know, the number of English users is increasing, um, the growth of these other languages on the internet is, you know, exceeding it, uh, uh, is growing at a much higher pace here. And I think that's what's um, really interesting to note. So, um, you know, if you can go to the site and, and look at some statistics. But there's some other things that also, um, you know, that, that, that are interesting when you see this chart. It shows that the top 10 languages here, you know, ranging from English to Korean, um, account for about, um, you know, 80 to or 80 percent of the language, uh, multilingual language usage on the internet. And that's about four and a half billion people. But then um, there's another two and a half billion people that are also using the internet in other languages that are not accounted for by these languages. So what's happening there? That's, that's one issue. Um, the other um, kind of interesting thing is when, when I saw this, I said, all right, English, Chinese, and you expect this to sort of correlate with the world populations, right? So you think, um, yeah, English, of course, because it's very universally spoken. China is a very large company, uh, country, and so it has a huge presence. Um, but because of my own South Asian background, I find not one single South Asian language here, no Indian language. None, none of those are present here in terms of, of the top 10 languages. And so one asks, why is that? And, and there's some answers for that. Um, in India, of course, uh, most of the communication actually on the internet happens in English. Um, but does that account for all the people who actually use the internet in, in, in India? There's some other statistics that I recently learned that only 12% of the population in India have internet access, whereas more than 70% of them have access to mobile phones. So if we enabled you know, mobile access to the internet, we would see a lot more participation from huge populations. And so that's, I think, one of the motivations and, and the challenges for those of us who are working in computational linguistics and and um, you know, getting computers to help understand languages also. So anyway, so these are some interesting statistics. So um, now we get to sort of, uh, what do you do? What does multilingual text mining mean? What kinds of work do you do? Uh, what kinds of uh, things are people interested in analyzing when, when they do text mining? So I'll just give you some examples of various kinds of things that we have been asked to look at. So sometimes people want to know, for example, uh, what is the language usage in a particular region or in a particular city? 
And so one way you could do this, and this is based on social media, of course. And by the way, the one thing I didn't mention when I showed you the previous chart, the reason why there is this explosive growth of usage uh, of language on the internet is because of social media. It's not that they're creating more pristine websites with literature and stuff like that, unfortunately. Most of the volume is accounted for by the uh, social media, which, you know, some of us sort of dismiss as teenagers just, you know, twittering about dates and stuff like that. But if the truth be told, if you go through and sift through all of that, there's, there's some really uh, nuggets of real information in all of that social media as well. So it's important to look at at, uh, look at both. Anyway, so this is one of the things you could do. One of the other types of analysis we did was during the whole Arab Spring movement, we looked at social media and we looked at, um, you know, we did uh, language analysis like this by region. And why would somebody want to do that? Well, for example, if you are looking at, um, uh, you know, the, the Mideast or maybe Dubai, and you started looking at uh, Chinese posts and you know, non-Arabic posts from a predominantly Arab region, you might get uh, a glimpse into what, let's say, the imported workers are talking about. They get a lot of workers, migrant workers, coming in from other countries. And these people tend to be the first people who are aware of any kind of situation because it impacts their jobs and their and their lifestyles. So uh, sometimes it's interesting to mine, you know, what is what's going on in Chinese or Hindi from from that particular. What are they talking about, and how is it different from what the native population is talking about? So some of those types of analysis is is what we get asked to do. Um, so this is an example of that. Um, this is again just Twitter traffic, but you know you can't analyze uh, societies uh, just by Twitter alone. For for certainly not. Uh, but, you, you know, it's, it still provides a lot of valuable information. So you can analyze social media. You can on, also analyze traditional media, and I'll show you an example of that. So in this case, you know, we were looking at different uh, hashtags that people were using on Twitter and some sentiment analysis and things like that. So it, at least it gives you, um, you know, some of these techniques may not be that accurate and maybe a little coarse. But when you start looking at the volume of data, sometimes it washes out some of those errors, and you really the trends actually do percolate quite well. Um, other kinds of things that you can do, and this is another effort that uh, we've been asked to work on, is uh, trending trend detection or meme detection. You know, what are people talking about? And of course, you can go to Twitter and you can see the top trending phrases, but that's from all of Twitter usage. You might want to look at specific sources. You might want to look at what are uh, trending phrases from this particular region, from these types of sources, and things like that, and also get the equivalent translations. And when you do this, you find out that if you take a certain time period, a time slice, uh, the types of uh, memes or trending phrases uh, from different regions vary. Sometimes, you know, they share a lot of things in common, but, but it's not, you know, different cultures, different societies talk about different things. So that shouldn't come as a big surprise, but you can actually quantitatively uh, go through and, and pick some of these out. So this is an example. We looked at um, uh, Urdu news around the time uh, of the bin Laden killing. And we looked at what kinds of things were, were percolating to the top. And some of these may not be um, a, as obvious as you think, like you know, uh, John Brennan, for example. We were wondering who that person was. And it turns out that he did have some connection to this story. Um, and if you looked at this versus just what was trending generally on Twitter, there was a lot of difference here. There was also stuff that was going on about uh, some assassination of some judicial person in that region, and so people were talking about that as well. So these are the kinds of things you can do if you can analyze um, media. The other kinds of things you might want to do is um, very factual analysis, so not just trends and topics, but if you're interested in, for example, if there's a, a disaster in some, like the tsunami, for example, 
um, and you want people are reporting they're using social media to communicate you know what happened here what happened where these are the roads that are passable not passable there's just a flood of information coming in and if you can take all that information summarize it succinctly present it to users there's a lot of very useful societal um, applications of analysis of this type of information as well so that's uh, another thing that you could do um, and then this is another project that we have been working on is to um, uh, analyze potential bias in media. So is it true that in some societies, certain segments of the press are, are actually using very inflammatory language, extremist messages to incite you know, popular opinion and so on, and can you quantitatively show that? So these are the kinds, and this is a project actually that the State Department is interested in. And they're interested in it for good reasons, to actually go and take the data back to the, to the media, you know, to the press, and talk to them and say, you know, why don't you help us work with us and see if we can tone down the rhetoric in certain publications. And they're actually getting a lot of buy-in. And they've uh, used this tactic, tactic in um, Afghanistan, Iraq, and now they're trying to do this in Pakistan also. So this project would involve um, and, and all of this is, is not, you're not going to read English newspapers and get a sense for this. It's really the vernacular. So it would be languages like Urdu and Pashto and these kinds of languages. So we've actually had some experience, quite a bit of experience working in Urdu and, and now getting into Pashto also. Um, and it's fascinating. All of them <laughs> look alike in terms of the script, but processing all of these languages, there's uh, uh, huge differences between them. And so again, quantitative analysis of, of this type. So another example of this. And so just to give you an example of, you know, if you were to do this properly, um, how challenging it could be um, in order to do this um, attitude or uh, non-topical analysis, as we call it, you have to identify opinion holders, the target, who is actually the target of the opinion, or what is the target of the opinion, and the actual attitude itself. So most people, when they look at this, they see green and red arrows that they show you on CNN for positive and negative. Um, and if nothing else, I hope to convince you that actually doing this type of sentiment uh, subjectivity analysis is quite challenging and quite deep, and we haven't solved it yet. We're nowhere near it. Um, we're trying, and I think we're making a lot of progress. So at least, for example, we can identify the agents and the targets reliably. But to really analyze that attitude, you need to understand so much about the context in which it was said and things like that. So there's a, a lot of work uh, remaining to be done there. But if we can, there's a lot of usages for it. So if you can do all of that, then you can actually present it in an interface like that, which I've worked on, <coughs> where you've looked at all the different content sources. And you, you can analyze according to organization, or organize according to location, and things like that, and allow, allow someone to actually see this type of uh, analysis result. So um, finally, um, The, um, the holy grail of text mining, which um, we're nowhere near, <laughs> but this is what we, you know, what people are really trying to attempt, is to see if you can actually do some predictive modeling. And that is by analyzing large volumes of data, analyzing trends, seeing what's happening, can you actually sort of predict that maybe there's going to be some kind of really disruptive event and when actually DARPA had a, has a challenge out here, not only do you have to say that there's going to be some pos possible disruptive event, but you know where and around what time also. So that type of prediction. And they used as an example for um, the London riots that went on. There was uh, a lot of stuff you know, that um, went on that you know, could possibly have helped if, if they analyzed the information in real time and, and tried to make sense of it. So predictive analytics is, is sort of the holy grail, and this is what people are, are trying to work on. And it's a hard problem. Um, OK, so, <clears throat> so if all of those weren't challenging enough, now I'll show you the real challenges in terms of dealing with the different languages. Um, so the first question um, you know, many people say, uh, ask is, 
you have all those different languages. You know, the we've spent 30 years and about, you know, I don't know how many billion dollars working on machine translation technology. Why can't we just translate everything to English? And um, I can give you that the answer is, in some cases, if you just want a quick triage summary of what's happening, machine translation uh, works pretty well. It, it's, it's effective. But for the kinds of analysis that we're trying to do, um, you lose a lot in the translation because looking for attitude, subjectivity is very nuanced type of information you're looking for. And you really need to look for this in the native language. So if nothing else, I've been making an argument everywhere I go that you, you know, machine translation is complementary to, uh, to, to actually processing in the native language. But you really have to be able to process the native language itself. So um, the other thing about machine translation systems is the way they're trained, you know, based on these parallel corpora of, you know, one language, another language, and they learn how to compute the translations. Um, because of that, they, they experience some uh, pitfalls. One is that they do a really poor job with translating names. So machine translation names typically garble names quite a bit. And that can be expected because names, you know, is it's an infinite set, right? It's not a closed set. You keep getting new names all the time. Unfortunately, a lot of the interesting things you want to extract uh, hang on names, right? You need to know who or what or where or something like that. So this is just an example of, um, in this case, it was some um, Urdu text. And if you feed it to Google, Google Translate, it comes out as, Education Minister Muhammad Hanif half dead, and actually his name. This is a name. It should have been Muhammad Hanif Atmar was the name, and so it, it garbled that. But once you get that wrong, you sort of lose a lot of the other information, right? I'm not making this up. It's it's actually true. So how can you solve something like this? So one of the things we do is we go through the native Urdu text, and the first thing we try and do is in the native language, try and identify names based on context. OK, so based on context, we know that that particular string must be a name. Now that you know that these characters are a name, then you do selective translation of that. And I can show you how we do that also. We use a lot of internet resources to try and do that once we know that this particular thing is a name. So this is where you know processing in the native language can really complement machine translation. Because you, you look at the native language, you, you tag things like names and translate those, possibly some you know, uh, subjectivity elements and translate those. And then you can feed it into a generic uh, machine translation system and get the full translation. So this is sort of where they work together. Um, the other issue is dialects also. So when you talk about Arabic, you know everyone uses modern standard Arabic. Um, that is, you know, the, the standard for printed or, you know, communicated forms that the media uses. Unfortunately, there's no one who actually speaks modern standard Arabic. It's, it's just something that they came up as a, uh, as a standard, you know, for just to standardize, you know, the, the various uh, communication. Uh, what people actually speak are Egyptian, Levantine, Iraqi, and things like that. So if you have a system that has just been adapted for modern standard Arabic, then you know, the sentence, there is no electricity, what happened? Um, you apply just an M MSA version on the actual dialect versions of these, and you can see what happens to the Google Translate. It, it totally goes wrong, which means that it's not just languages themselves, but the dialects themselves also that need um, a lot of attention. And this actually can, uh, is where you know, a lot of this uh, machine translation and multilingual text mining can get pretty challenging um, because of all the dialectical variations. So we actually worked on a project um, where we collaborated with Columbia University. And what they were trying to do was look at the various dialects and see if they could at least normalize based on dialects. And that way, you could get um, better translations of these. So another problem. Um, and here's an opportunity to use the web as corpus. So I talk about multilingual text mining and all that, but one of the major usages of multilingual text mining is actually to improve the quality of translation. The whole web can be treated as a corpus. And 
The, my favorite uh, data set right now is multilingual Wikipedia. We just love it because, you know, typically you have, you know, articles like this. This one is on Barack Obama, but you have a Chinese version, you have an Arabic version. And if you can figure out some points of correspondence, you get immediate translations. You get the correct name translations. You get all kinds of other things that uh, you can immediately translate, right? Um, so machine translation systems, the way they're designed is someone has to sit down and say, this is the English version, this is the Chinese version. It requires an enormous amount of labor and hand annotation, um, very time consuming, very expensive. But sources like multilingual Wikipedia, you know, people are doing that for you, right? This is the, the beauty of crowdsourcing, really. People are writing this, they're providing the links. Um, but it's not as perfect as, as you would think. Some people don't bother to backlink correctly. So you, yes, you'll have a, a version in, in English, you'll have a version in Arabic, but if the person who authored the page doesn't supply the backlinks and things like that, you miss out on some of the information as well. Um, so anyway, uh, what we are doing right now is on a regular basis, sometimes nightly, but at least uh, weekly, um, mining multilingual Wikipedia to extract uh, translations, primarily name translations. And, and, and all of you know in Wikipedia, any name, any event that's of any significance, within a few minutes, there's going to be a Wikipedia page about it. Um, so why not try and exploit that? So in my opinion, um, the, one of the biggest applications of multilingual text mining now is actually learning language resources, how to translate, you know, how to, you know, even do chunking and things like that, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then you have these other kinds of uh, <laughs> phenomena on, on the, the web uh, that you have seen, uh, code mixing and switching. Um, so this is where, you know, this is very, very common in South Asian languages. Um, there's, in India, if you go there, people speak what's called Hinglish, which is a combination of Hindi and English. And really, um, you know, sometimes it's annoying unless you know both languages. They'll start a sentence in English, they'll use some Hindi words in between, and they'll finish the sentence in English. It's just, you know, back and forth between the two languages. And it's, it's just how all the younger people speak nowadays. Um, and the most interesting thing to me is that, you know, Hindi is a language that's predominantly, you know, spoken in, in um, uh, the northern and the middle parts of India. In southern India, Hindi was not spoken. But even in southern India, the youth start using this Hinglish phenomenon of mixing Hindi and English. And it's not just in South Asia. Now you see, um, I'm not an expert in Spanish, but I'm assuming that you have Spanglish, where you know on the web people are using combinations of Spanish and English and stuff like that. Um, Urdish is another language, and you know this causes nightmares for people who are building uh, computational tools because it's bad enough you have to build it in English and Urdu and Spanish, but now you've got this mixture. And I had a student who actually um, was, was working on this problem. And this you see in, in social media, especially, um, on all the blogs and things like that. Um, so anyway, so all kinds of solutions for this, which I'm not going to get into. This is more technical stuff. But you, know, you have to apply all kinds of things in, in terms of applying two different language systems to try and understand this stuff. Um, finally, um, one of the. Uh, the, the major areas that I think, um, I, I think I've hinted at this uh, before, um, language resource acquisition. I think there's a tremendous opportunity right now to do this because of all that multilingual usage on the web. And what do I mean by um, language resource acquisition? So if you're designing um, you know, natural language processing systems or text mining or machine translation, any kind of language technology, if you're actually trying to put together, you need a lot of resources for the language. You need uh, lexicons or dictionaries, right? electronic versions of this. You need translation lexicons. You need some uh, basic syntactic analysis type of tools, like part of speech taggers and chunkers, which basically group into noun phrases, verb phrases, things like that. So these are all the building blocks of what go into a, a language processing system for a given language. 
The problem is it's, it's very expensive to produce these resources by hand. And the government actually has spent tons of money producing these kinds of uh, resources. So for, for English, for the European languages, for um, uh, even Arabic and Chinese, um, all these languages actually have very rich linguistic resources right now. But what happens when you go to those, what they call less commonly taught languages? And um, you know, different people have different uh, uh, definitions of what uh, a less commonly taught language is. But it could include things like Yoruba, which is spoken in West Africa. A Russian, believe it or not, um, doesn't have as many resources available. Swahili. Um, and uh, Somali, for example, um, all these kinds of new languages that are coming up. Um, so th the web actually provides a great opportunity to automatically see if you can construct these resources by looking at corpora like multilingual Wikipedia and blogs and do trend mining and see this phrase must correspond to this phrase and so on. So this is what um, some of my research has focused on. And, and this slide here, which the stuff, the diagram on the left-hand side, you don't have to really look at in detail, but uh, we're using a lot of machine learning technologies and what we call semi-supervised machine learning technologies to see if we can acquire these resources. So I think you know this this is a very exciting time to be working um, in this area of multilingual text processing, and um, I have students who are working on this on on various types of uh, projects. Um, so um, I guess <laughs> I was intrigued by some of the pictures I saw yesterday, uh, especially the first one where you had, what was that? Uh, you had two people with didn't have bodies, and you know there, were, there was the, the abstract concept of what they were supposed to be saying, and they were communicating it through language. Um, so in my world, this sort of translates to this, <laughs> where you know maybe you do have bodies and so on, but the important thing is that they're using some kind of uh, uh, a, a speech to speech to speech translation. So I think this is the real challenge for our field. Um, speech to speech is, is one of the hardest problems you can think of. Um, and I think you know here we're going between two different languages. Um, but all of you can relate to this. Anyone who has called one of those customer service type of calls where you dial one, say yes, say no, uh, I mean, it's, it's really hard, right? Um, and in spite of that, I think we've actually made a lot of progress in this. So for single utterance, um, it does, uh, you can actually get reasonable translations. But if you say that you're trying to understand you know, attitude or you're trying to understand dialogue, anything beyond like one or two sentences, um, the problem is the context, right? Someone was mentioning yesterday of you have to understand the history, the, the culture, uh, what was previously said. Um, from a computational aspect, we refer to all of this as context. And so the, the critical question is, how do you come up with computational models for actually trying to model this type of context. And there have been several efforts that attempt to do this. One effort that recently um, uh, is taking place is metaphorical analysis of language. When you're trying to use, read something, people use so many metaphors. Can you actually build up a library of these metaphors and know when it applies and what type of context it suggests and things like that? So I think this is uh, one of the critical um, problems. So even if, if we can solve all the, you know, someone called it nouns and verbs problems, um, which we're trying to do by, you know, looking at multilingual uh, web data, uh, this uh, problem of modeling context is, is an enormously challenging problem. Um, and you need to do that if you're going to actually understand dialogue. And I guess the last comment I'd like to make is that, um, you know, I see, uh, you know, one of my issues is also the preservation of certain dialects that are, I think, going to go extinct because, um, you know, especially from where I'm coming from, we speak a certain uh, dialect in our community. Um, it continues in this generation, but, you know, we're having a hard time conveying this to the next generation. And uh, what I noticed was that there are some people, younger people, who have actually started blogging about this on the net and trying to document you know, why our dialect is the way it is. 
And actually, I mean, nothing has existed so far. It's not like it's an ancient tradition. Dialects are just verbally passed on, right? So there's no book or source material. But I see now efforts from, from younger people who are actually trying to document what these phrases and what these words mean, where they come from. So I think um, there's a lot of positive aspects to um, you know, this kind of uh, use, even by the youth. So anyway, um, that, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you.